my word for this morning. It's entitled Power of Unity. The power of what? Unity. The power of unity. According to Genesis chapter 11, if you read verse 1 to 9, we know that all people in the world at that time spoke one language. They were all speaking one language. So their unity of language allowed the people to do and to collaborate and to work effectively with one another. So what did they do? They decided to build a tower, which we all know. How many of us have heard of the Tower of Babel? They decided to build a tower, which is called the Tower of Babel. They wanted to reach the heavens with that tower. And guess what? Genesis 11 verse 5 says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, mm, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them to do. Are you hearing what the scripture is saying? If as what one people speaking one language, and now let's not mistake the speaking of one language to talking about, you know, the languages that we talk, there is no specific language or no important language, but we have the language of the Holy Spirit. If we are in unity, we are in one accord of one mind in the spirit, desiring to do whatever it is that we want to do together as a ministry, nothing can be impossible. Nothing can stop us from achieving whatever it is that we want to achieve. So you see, unity of purpose is powerful, is a powerful tool, tool for success in life. Can you imagine a husband and wife? The one says, we need to buy a house. The other one says, no, we need to buy a car. It happens, doesn't it? Because people's priorities are different. The one says, no, 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 we need to buy a house. Well, in that case, we need to go on a holiday. I'm tired. At the end of the day, this couple achieve nothing because there is no unity of purpose. But when they put their minds together and they are in agreement, we are going to build a house. I'm telling you, give them time. It doesn't matter if it takes 10 years, that house will stand because of that unity of purpose. So that's what God is calling us as Palm of Gilead right now. That's what he's calling us to do. You see, the enemy hates unity for that very purpose. Without unity, you achieve nothing. In that time, what did God do? He says, let's confuse the language. If we confuse the language, the people will not be able to continue with the building. And what happened? He confused their languages. And then one says, can you bring me a brick? The other one says, Dipe brick. The other one says, This one, what are you talking about? I can't understand. What do you want? There was chaos. There was confusion in the midst of the city. And they failed to build. The building came to a standstill. I'm telling you, the enemy uses the same strategy when he sees you, have, you have purposed in your hearts that this is what we are 
aiming for. This is what we desire. This is what we are going to do. And we are going for it as a group. Guess what happened? In the midst of that rejoicing, when you can see that the plan is taking off, then the enemy comes and whispers to this one and say, did you see how Enya was looking at you? You know, she really gave you the eye. You know what I mean by the eye. And the next thing she's saying, yes, I saw that eye. I was wondering what that I was about. And then trouble begins to start in paradise. Misunderstandings come. Mistrust comes. You don't trust what he's saying because the enemy has whispered something to you. And disunity brings the work to a halt. We saw that as well when Nehemiah was building the walls. What did Tobiah and Sanpale try to do? They tried to bring destruction. They were trying to distract people from focusing on the building of the walls. Come for this party. Come and do that. Come and do that. Because their motive was to ensure that the building did not continue. Now why is God telling us all this? Because we have started something in the spirit. You may not see it in the physical realm, but I'm telling you, something started in the spiritual realm during the conference. God has set up a standard. He has set up a pace, and we have to maintain that. We have to keep that going, but the only way we are going to maintain that is through unity. It is through unity. Without that unity, we are not going to be able to achieve anything. But you see, there is no unity without love. That's the one thing they noticed. We all put on our best, best act, best behavior. Was it an act? Uh -huh. If it wasn't an act, then it should continue. Yes, because if you didn't put it on, then it should continue to flow because it becomes your nature. It becomes a part of who you are. You don't have to try to love people. You just love people. You don't have to try to smile. The smile just comes automatically. But you see, that was another sign that God was in the house. Because God is love. When God is in the house, when love is in the house, Everybody feels the love. Everybody begins to be drawn to that love. So to keep the love, we got to keep God. To keep the love, we have to keep the spirit flowing. To keep the unity, we have to maintain the love. You know, Jesus is one desire. Let's go to the book of John. I want you to see something. Jesus had a desire in his heart for the church. And before he died, he began to talk to his father about the church. What did Jesus say? I'll read John 17. I'll read from verse 20. If your Bible is like mine, it's put there at the top, Jesus prays for all believers. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That is so clear. He wasn't praying for the 12 disciples alone. He was praying for you and me who will believe through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Wow. Wow. What is the prayer of Christ? See, sometimes I think whoever did the Bible missed it there. They put the prayer of Christ as our Father which art in heaven. Christ wasn't praying, he was teaching on prayer. 
That was the teaching on prayer. The disciple says, Master, teach us how to pray. And then he says, you pray like this. So he wasn't praying. He was teaching them. But here in John 17, he is praying for the church. He is praying for you and I. And his prayer, the desire of his heart is that we may be one. We may be like him. Him and his father were one. Then I began to think about this. You know, I began to think about this. When Jesus walked the earth, he did so many miracles, signs and wonders that even the critics who didn't believe he was the son of God ended up saying no human can do what you do unless God has sent him or God is with him. That's why Jesus said, if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe the works that I'm doing. But Jesus also said something very striking that we should take note of. Hallelujah. In John chapter 5, verse 19, John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Can you see how it ties to unity? Me and my father, we are one. Because me and my father are one, whatever the father is doing, that's what I am doing. Whatever the father is saying, that's what I am saying. Wherever the father is going, that's where I am going. Because me and the father, we are one. We are united. We cannot be separated. Is it making sense to someone? I was looking at that cross when Jesus was dying. Again, I saw how this truth came to light. Do you know that when they were hitting him, he was like a lamb. He never opened his mouth. 39 stripes on his back. Blood dripping down. He never said a word. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He never opened his mouth. They put him on the cross. They put nails on his hands and nails on his feet. He never said a word. But the time came when the father left. Remember he said, me and the father are one. But when the father left, why did the father leave? How do I know the father left? Because Jesus suddenly cries, Father, why have you forsaken me? Yet he didn't cry when they were beating him. So the most pain he felt was the separation from the father. Because him and the father were in unity, they were in one. But why did the father leave him at such a crucial moment when he needed the father more than anything else? You know why the father left? Because at that moment, Jesus became sin. He carried the sins of the world. And God and sin cannot be together. There is no unity between darkness and light. At that point when Christ was seen, the unity ended and the father stepped back and that's what happens in our lives church we can enjoy being in the presence of god we can enjoy having fellowship with the holy ghost we can enjoy sensing his presence entering stepping into worship and god is there and we feel him and we know that he's there and we are rejoicing in his presence until we allow sin to come between us and and the Father, then that unity is broken. I remember an elderly woman years back, you know, there was a, a, 
a conference, not really a conference, I don't know what you call it, let's call it a conference. And they made an altar call. Many people came to the front, we being the ushers and the counselors, we have to stand with people and then take the people aside to talk to them. So I went with this woman, she was as old as my mother, and I said, what would you like God to do for you? And she said, you know, I used to enjoy being in the presence of God. I could pay, pray. The minute I started praying, I was in the presence of God. It was so beautiful. But now, when I pray, it's just dry. There is nothing. And I know that God is not there. Because I've been in his presence. And I know when the presence is not there. And I said, Mama, the Bible says only one thing can separate you from God. Sin. What have you been up to? Then she says, yes, I know. My daughter was sick. And the doctors couldn't do anything. I was afraid she was going to die. And somebody says, I know someone who can help. So off I went to the witch doctor. They did whatever they did and my daughter became well. But then when I went back to the closet, God wasn't there anymore. And God has not been there since that time. So I said, so you knew all along what the problem is? Yes. So we all know when we are cut off from the presence of God, we know what the problem is. The issue is we fail to deal with things. And then they pile up and they pile up to a point where it's overwhelming. And we can't do anything anymore. Me and my father, we are one, Jesus said. Everything I do is what I see my father do. I don't know whether you are getting what I'm saying this morning. We said this year's theme is what? Walking in what? In power and in greater authority, greater power and greater authority. That's where God is taking us, church. That's where we are going. But until we recognize what Jesus says, that apart from the Father, I can do nothing, then we are in trouble. We need to come to a place where we recognize how much we need the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How much we need the unity of the Holy Spirit. First, we need to be united as a people ourselves. But then our unity without the Holy Spirit achieves nothing as well. Being united is our first step. But then we need to now seek the unity of the Spirit, that we are united with the Spirit. Because when we are one with the Spirit, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed, that they may be in us. So we need to be in him because he is in the Father. And so then we are in unity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing what God is saying? Then when we are in unity, what happens? When we are in unity and we come to a service and someone comes in our midst and there's something going on in their lives, when we look at that person, we are not seeing them with the eyes of the flesh. We are seeing them through the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why we are failing to step into the gifts of the Holy Spirit because there is no unity between us and the Holy Spirit. We are not in unity with the Holy Spirit. We need the unity as individuals. I need to be united with the Holy Spirit myself as an individual. We need to be united with the Holy Spirit as a ministry together so that we can do the works of Christ, which Christ himself says, I cannot do it without the Father. And that's the prayer. Father, that they may be one, even as you and I are one, that they may be in us and we in them. That's the unity. And then when there's a unity in the, in the spirit, you will see what God will do. There is no demon that would stand in this house. 
I tell you, I've seen it. Hmm. That's why God is redigging the wells. Before we came to the UK, when we were in Zimbabwe, my goodness, demons never stood at Palm of Gilead. We didn't have to approach people. Demons will fall where they are standing and people will crawl by themselves. Some will be crawling, trying to get out of the building, crawling on their hands and knees. And the deliverance was happening. God was moving. Then we came to this country. It was tough. Things changed. God hasn't gone. We have seen a bit here and there, but we are not where God wants us to be. But that's where God is taking us again. That's why he is redigging. He is resetting, you know, realigning everything so that we can once again here in this nation see the same power, the same anointing, the same workings of the Holy Ghost, the same miraculous power that when the worship begins, man, you know, we used to see amazing things. We didn't have videos. We, we did have the thick, thick um, cassettes that you used to put on the thing. And with over the years, when we moved, the people didn't take care of the cabinet. They lost the whole cabinet with everything. You would be amazed if you watch the videos of what God used to do at the church. You would, you, you would be amazed. It will blow your mind what God was doing. One day a drunkard came to the meeting, stone drunk, and he came to the altar. We were doing a, a crusade out in the open air. The ushers tried to stop him, but I said, let him be. He came to the altar. I says, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. And I took him through the process, prayed for him. Everybody thought it's a waste of time. Do you know the next morning he was the first to arrive for the service? He says, Pastor, I'm sober now, and I still want Jesus. And that man is still serving the Lord today. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not the doing of men. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, the problem why we got people who are not transformed, people who have never experienced the power of God touching their lives in the churches because we are not in alignment with the Holy Ghost. We are not in alignment with the Holy Ghost. You know, when I was reading Ezekiel, you know the story of Ezekiel. I shared it at the conference and I'm sharing it again because to me, it holds the key. When Ezekiel saw the glory of God, when he saw the spirit and the wheels, you know, if, if you ask God, this morning the prayer said we must ask God to give us what? Open our understanding and open our hearts to receive. Ask God to open your understanding and see what I'm seeing. Ezekiel sees God on the move, but he sees the Spirit of God is on the move. And then he sees wheels that are attached to that presence. And he says, wherever the Spirit went, the wheels went. When the Spirit went south, the wheels turned south. When the Spirit went north, the wheels turned north. Why? Because the Spirit was in the wheels. We are the wheels. When there is unity between the church and the Holy Spirit, we become the picture that Ezekiel saw. We go where the Spirit goes. We say what the Spirit says. We do what the Spirit is telling us to do. That's where miracles come from. I was teaching people and telling people, you know, we have a misunderstood faith for years. That's why the church is where we are today. Because we thought that faith meant that I can just say by faith that bottle is going to stand up and walk to me so I can drink it. That's the kind of faith, you, you name it, you believe it, and it's yours. And people, you know, in our days, people were crazy with faith. They would go to a garage, lay hands on a car, and claim it and say, no one is buying this car, it is mine in Jesus' name. And then they expect the car to be in their garage. Then they were disappointed because the car never came home. But what they were doing, they were blocking the poor man from selling his car because they bound that car. You know, faith 
has to do with hearing from God. Faith has to do with you being in unity with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit says, pray for that woman. She's got cancer. I'm going to heal her. Then fear says, what if nothing happens? But faith says, in the name of Jesus, be healed. That's what the faith, the biblical faith is about. You have to first hear from God. You have to work together with the Holy Spirit. It's not about you doing your own thing and hoping for the best. This is what we've been doing all along, isn't it? We do our own thing and we hope for the best. But when you walk by faith, God will speak to you. This is what I want you to do. Sometimes God says, just pray for people with headaches and that's it. And then you start saying, people with cancers, people with tuberculosis come. But God says, I'm just healing people with headaches. It's the same like God gives you a prophecy. And then you, you give the word and start explaining it. If God didn't give you the explanation, be very careful. You just say the word as it came and leave it there because someone in the meeting will understand what God is talking about, even if it doesn't make sense to you. But the temptation is that we now try to make it make sense and then we change what God has said. We make it sensible, if you hear what I'm saying. But God knows what he's talking about, and God knows who he's talking to. And the person that God is talking to will know the messages for them. You don't have to understand anything. You speak by faith, because you trust God. You trust God. And this is where we are going, church. This is where we are going. We're not going to do church as usual. We're not going to do worship as usual. We need to allow the Holy Ghost to have his way. We need to allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to begin to flow. We need to be, you know, the, the greatest hindrance to walking in the gifts is fear and pride. Because if you come and you give your word and I say, sorry, you didn't get it right this time. Oh, oh, your pride is wounded. Yeah, your pride is wounded. Oh, Rev embarrassed me. You know, uh, embarrassed me. I'm not, I'm not going to go back there anymore because she embarrassed me in front of people. What did you want me to do? Make you tell lies before people. No, I'm serious, church. You can't just get it from the first time you're getting it all right. You, you grow in the gift. You grow in the gift. I mean, I've been preaching for 30 years, but when I look back at the things I used to preach 30 years ago, was that me? Did I say that? Oh my God, I want to delete it. Because that was the level where I was 30 years ago. It looked amazing when I preached in those years. But now, because I have grown, I now look back and think, okay, those were baby steps. We all need to take baby steps. The thing is, God will also test your pride. Because God will never use anybody with pride. Never. If you have pride, forget. God will never use you. Because you need to be corrected. You need to be willing to take correction in order for you to grow in your gifting. In order for you to separate your own voice and the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy to do that. But time, you grow, you begin to understand that last time I saw this, it meant this. Last time I heard this and this is what happened. So you are growing in it. You are learning in it. But if you sit on your gift, you are not going to do anything. And God will hold you accountable. Amen? God will hold you accountable for sitting on the gift. Me, I'd rather be wrong than keep it in case somebody needed to hear that. In case it would have transformed and changed somebody's life completely. I remember 
talking about Florida years back when I went there. You know, the lady that I was with was supposed to do the preaching that day. And then for some reason, she decided last minute she didn't have a sermon. So when they called her to come and preach, guess what she did? She got up, went to the pulpit, greeted everybody, and then say, well, I'm not the speaker today. I brought someone who's going to speak. I could have choked her to death. My first time overseas, I hadn't prayed. I, hadn't, I didn't have anything to say. Now everybody is looking at me. What do I do? So I got up and I, I tried to sing a song. Have you heard me singing? <laughs> you know, that's some of the things you look back and you laugh until you cry tears. It was awful, the song. <laughs> I mean, singing for Americans, of all the people. <laughs> you know, because I thought, is that how they sing in Africa? <laughs> poor, poor people. And the song was long. Then the song got finished. And then I said, what next? Then I'm crying inside, Lord, please. Lord, please. Then God says, Isaiah 58. And I say, let's open Isaiah 58. Because I don't know what I'm supposed to do with Isaiah 58. I read the whole chapter from verse 1 to the end. When I finished the last verse, then God began to talk. It began to flow, and I thought, oh, praise the Lord. It was flowing, and I was talking, and I was talking, and I was talking, and I turned, I looked to the pastor, and I began to talk to the pastor, and I finished the talking. I said, God is saying, there's somebody here, you broke your back, and this giant of a man was brought forward. They were holding him. And he came forward. I prayed for him. He jumped the sky high and ran around the whole building over and over again. Then the, the church elder got up and said, I suppose we have no clue what's happening here. I said, mm hmm I had no clue what was happening. Then he says, this is an amazing day. God had to bring someone all the way from Africa to come and tell us the right way to go. Isaiah 58 is the scripture that founded this ministry. I didn't know that. And then she began to talk. I was shocked, really shocked. Then she turned around and says, this man is a well-known basketball player and he injured his back playing basketball. He hasn't been in church for three years. We are shocked to see him in church today. So the guy says, I woke up in the morning, something told me I must come to church. When I say to my wife, we are going to church, says, how are you going to sit? You haven't sat on a chair for three years. So she brought cushions and everything. They were sitting right at the back of the church with all cushions around the man. God healed that man because God wanted to confirm his word. Why? I had nothing to do with it. I hadn't prayed. I hadn't prepared, I hadn't planned anything. I was put in a corner and in my fear, God moved. Because my brain was not able to interfere because I didn't know what I was doing. Our brains are the problem, people. God wants to move, God wants to do something, but your mind interferes. Because you start thinking, what if I'm wrong? That doesn't make sense. I mean, God is saying, Pastor, God doesn't give you any blessing with strings attached. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what blessing the pastor got. And he turned out a millionaire, gave them one million dollars. And the church said no. Because the church was involved with repatriation of drug addicted families. And this millionaire was a drug lord trying to stop the church from interfering with what they were doing. So the pastor was saying money is money. 
It doesn't matter where the money is coming from. Right now we need the money. And the elders were saying, no, but that is unclean money. We can't take the money from the enemy. And the, the church split. So the week before we came, the church split in half. The other people left. What we found was half a church. But we didn't know all that. We didn't know all that. Do you know the pastor was so afraid to sit next to me. He didn't know that I didn't know anything. I was a harmless person. He thought I was going to start exposing a lot of things. The pastor wouldn't sit at the table. And then he made an excuse that he had somewhere to go. He left us in his house sitting at the table to have a meal. He couldn't sit because he was afraid. I'm telling you the power of God. I'm telling you how God is able to move. People, you know, time is running out. These are the end times. God is looking for a church that is willing so he can pour out everything on the church. You know, time is running out. All these fake churches, they are going to disappear nicely and slowly. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the living God. Right now there's a massive falling away, but there's revival coming. God is going to move in power and glory. And people that were deceived will see the truth and they will be restored. They will repent and they will come again before the end comes. Are you willing to be a part of that revival? Are you willing to partner with the Holy Spirit or not? How do we get this unit quickly? Be holy. How do I become holy? Hate sin and honor God. Be holy. Hate sin and honor God. That's what holiness is about. Pray without ceasing. Fast and pray. Some people want the Holy Ghost, but they don't pray. They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't care what comes out of their mouths. You know, they speak as they please. They do whatever is right in their own eyes. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Pray without ceasing. Fast and pray. And then love. Love people unconditionally. Because love is of God. Bible says whether they be prophecies, they will pass away. But love, it will never pass away. Because God is love. So love, be a person that's full of love. Be a person that's full of compassion. Don't be judgmental. Don't be critical. Don't point fingers. Don't fault find. Desire to hear from God. But sometimes we want to hear from God and when God speaks, we are not willing. We are not willing to do what God is saying. So desire to hear, but also desire to be willing. God, give me a willing heart to do what you are telling me to do. Be willing to do. Have faith. Do away with being fearful. Because fear is the opposite of faith. If you are fearful, you have no faith. And how do you do that? By trusting God. Trust God. Trust in his love. Trust in his mercy. Trust in his faithfulness. And you can never go wrong. Prayer is the key. Living a holy life is the key to being in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Like I said, where they sin, the Holy Spirit will not stay. You know, you heard the story of pigeons. I don't know about the pigeons here in this country because they seem to be everywhere. But the pigeons back home, we were always told that the pigeons never stay in a house where they are always quarreling. You can have your pigeons, give them food, give them water, give them everything. But when there's strife in that home, the pigeons will go and live next door where there's peace. And that would be a sign that all is not right in that house. 
That's how the Holy Spirit is. He will not dwell where there's strife. He will not dwell where there's bitterness. He will not dwell where there's anger. He will not dwell where there's unforgiveness, fault finding, gossip. So you have to choose to be holy. You must purpose in your heart that you are not going to remain behind because God is moving. God is moving. Purpose in your heart that you are not going to be the cause of disunity in the body. Because unity is very important to God. I would rather suffer wrong than cause disunity. How many of us are willing to suffer wrong? Ah, me, you don't do that to me. You can't do that to me and get away with it. I will show you who I am. Then forget about the Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen. You have to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. You have to be willing to tolerate. That's why the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering, tolerance, perseverance. The problem with us is we can't even persevere. A little gossip, my God, is, we, we make a big thing, and yet we, sometimes we are the biggest gossiper. You know, it's okay for me to talk about everybody else, but they don't dare talk about me. So purpose in your heart that you are not going to be the cause of disunity among the brethren. Be a peacemaker. Doesn't the Bible say, blessed are the peacemakers? Hallelujah. Purpose in your heart to guard the unity of the church. Guard the unity of the church. I'm telling you, there's so, such a blessing to the peacemakers. Such a blessing. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called what? The sons of God. Which means if you are not a peacemaker, you are not the son of God. And if you are not the son of God, whose son are you then? Blessed are the peacemakers. You have to be willing to suffer wrongfully. After all, he say, blessed are ye when they persecute you for righteousness sake. What part of it don't we understand? Hmm. You see, when we were growing and learning, we had tough teachers. I picked up an offense with a, another lady in the ministry. Then I went to the leader, I said, I'm very wounded. This is what so and so did to me. And I expected a little bit of compassion and understanding. But guess what I got? Have you ever seen a dead body? What has that got to do with my issue? Have you ever seen a dead person? I said, yes. What happens when you kick them? Nothing, they are dead. What happens when you talk about them when they are lying there? Well, they can't hear. Then he says, well, I thought you were dead in Christ. How did you hear what so and so said? I thought, what? You see, because we are not dead, we are alive, very much alive. We hear all the gossip, we hear everything. And when we are pinched, we feel the pain because we have not surrendered. We are not dead to self. When you can come to a place in your life where somebody does something to you and you say, it's not important. You know what I say? They are entitled to their opinion. Yes, they are. The gossiper is entitled to their opinion. That is their opinion. And I don't have to live by your opinion of me. You are entitled to make your own opinion of me. That's your opinion. You keep to it. At the end of the day, the only opinion that counts is God's opinion of me. That's what counts. 
although it doesn't excuse you for living a rough life and saying, I don't care about people's opinion, that's not what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 4.3, my last scripture. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Amen. Every opportunity to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So without being a peacemaker, we will not achieve unity. Is that true or not? We will not achieve unity without peacemakers in the house. We need people that will defuse the bomb before it blows up. People that will say to somebody, I'm sure you misunderstood. I'm sure they didn't mean what you think they were saying. I'm sure they didn't think it through. I'm sure they're not even aware that you are hurt. Don't go making pity parties and encouraging. That's causing disunity. That's causing disunity. Hallelujah. Is God talking to somebody this morning? Hmm. You see, part of the move of God is to teach us the, the word, is to give us knowledge. It's not enough for us to want to swim in the river without instructions of what to do no, so that you don't drown. You know you can drown in the, in the anointing. You can drown in the river. So we need the word as much as we need the spirit. The balance is the spirit and the word. The spirit and the word. The spirit and the word. Some Sundays we'll have the spirit. Some Sunday we have the word. God is still moving. God is still talking. Let's not shut our ears and say, ah, we expected God to do things. You know, God is not the business of entertainment. It's true. I mean, there is no new member here. There is no visitor here. There is no immature person here. You've all sat under the word for years now. So why should God entertain you? Tell me. Why should God spoon feed you? Why should he give you a, 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 a cup of milk? You're not a baby. So sometimes when we don't see what we want to see, we think there's something wrong with the church. There is nothing wrong with the church. God can't entertain us Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. When there's a conference, the power comes because there are people who don't know the power. There are people who have needs. You bring people here with needs and see what God's going to do. Amen, church. Yes, evangelize and find people who need a touch from God. Find people who need to be set free and then see whether God is not going to set them free. But for you to come alone Sunday after Sunday and expect a performance, you'll be very disappointed because God is not going to entertain us. But he wants us to learn, he wants us to grow, he wants us to mature. Amen. He, number six, Verse 24 to 26 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah. We are going to swap Psalms 91 with number 6, verse 24 to 26. Can... I, we're not going to do it now, but I'm asking somebody for next Sunday to begin to use this scripture because what we need now is to move on with the peace of God. 
We need the unity. We need the peace of God. We need God to be gracious upon us. We need God to begin to add to our numbers. We need God to multiply the church. We need God to grow the church, to build the church. We need to step out in faith and begin to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not only in the church, at work, at home, in the streets, wherever you are, you can be used by God. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. We thank you for your word this morning, that your word is yes and amen. We thank you, my God, that you are drawing us, Lord, for a deeper walk with you. Father, we are in the river, but we desire that the waters must rise higher and higher and higher until we are swimming in that river. Father, we want to see the gifts of the Holy Ghost, all nine of them, functioning in the church. We want to see, my God, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, functioning in our lives. Father, that we have a balance, we have the fruits and we have the gifts. We do not want, Lord, to operate in the gifts without the fruits. We do not want, my God, to come and prophesy falsely to be seen by men. But we desire to partner with the Holy Ghost. We desire to be one with the Holy Spirit, even as Jesus was one with the Father. That we may do the works of Christ, even greater works. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.